Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Alex Petrashevsky. And before we get started today, I'd just like to extend a thanks to Tracy for organizing the low carb lifestyle long weekend today. And also a big thanks for everyone who's tuning in today to watch all the presentation. So today I'm gonna to be talking about red meat and cancer and offering a bit of an update into this space over the last few years. It's a topic that comes up very frequently in my uh, clinical practice. And also it's a topic that's never too far out of the limelight when it comes to media and health reporting. So before we get started a little bit about me, I'm a fellow of the College of General Practitioners uh, and I've got a personal and professional passion for low carb way of eating. I've used it to improve my own health and also the health of my patients. Uh, I've used this uh, professional passion to, and along with my wife, Dr. Deepa Mahananda, to help um, start up a practice in Sydney called Sydney Low Carb Specialist. Uh, we, this is a doctor and dietitian team-based uh, clinic where we, we see the whole gamut of low carb medicine and help patients with a variety of, of health issues. Uh, before I get started, I've got no personal or professional disclosures and this presentation does not constitute any individual medical advice. So let's have a look at the food, uh, female food habits in marketing. Uh, this is a typical snapshot of what uh, women are told they should be eating or what a healthy woman looks like in, in media. So you can see there's a very little protein generally, and if there is, uh, it's typically seafood or chicken, and predominantly lots of salads and vegetables that they're, they're told to eat. When we look at the typical meat consumption of the average Australian over time, it's not surprising based on this that our intake of beef, lamb and mutton has gone down quite significantly. Half a century ago, these were the predominant meats that were eaten in Australia. And over this time, the intake of chicken has gone up dramatically and the intake of pork has gone up as well. So why is red meat important? Well, first of all, it's, a, it's an excellent source of protein. Uh, it, it contains many essential amino acids along with uh, large quantities of various vitamins, including vitamin A, B6, B12, D and E. It's also a fantastic source of certain trace minerals, in particular iron, but also zinc and selenium. And the fat that we get when we eat red meat, uh, it also helps us absorb certain fat soluble vitamins as well. I'm just gonna focus in on these two at the moment because they're particularly relevant for, for a lot of women. So iron deficiency is a very common problem that I see in clinical practice, and it has a variety of different symptoms. Um, it has various cognitive effects. So often uh, women will complain of fatigue, headache, or lack of concentration. Uh, it, it has effects on your connective tissue uh, in the body. So broken hair or thin or, uh, or lost hair is a common presentation as is dry skin or brittle fingernails. There are also effects on the gut in terms of uh, loss of appetite and various gastrointestinal complaints. And if the iron deficiency is severe enough, you can end up with anemia, which causes issues in terms of exercise tolerance. So a wide variety of clinical syndromes associated with that. When we look at iron balance in the body, it's really a three-part equation. So the first part of the equation is iron in. So that, that basically is your dietary intake. So red meat's the best source of dietary iron by a long way. Other meats will have some, but not quite as much. And as a general rule, plant foods are a fairly poor source of iron. So some of them do have some iron in it, but it's not particularly bioavailable. Lastly, for some people, they need iron supplements to get adequate intake if they've got certain dietary restrictions. The second part of the equation is iron losses or iron out. And this is in particularly important for women because during their reproductive years, uh, they've often got a, a monthly hit to their blood balance where they're losing blood during menstruation. And this is an issue that men don't have. Um, so the irony is that a lot of women don't eat very much red meat when really they need it more than men in some ways. Gastrointestinal bleeding can also cause loss of iron, so that's an important cause not to miss. And then the third part of the equation is your ability to absorb iron. So you can take the iron in, but if you're not actually absorbing it, uh, you can have issues with that iron deficiency. So celiac disease and other inflammatory bowel disorders can affect your ability to absorb iron, as can certain medications. And, there, and there's certain genetic predispositions to, to low iron in some families. Unfortunately, a large amount of women in the Western world spend a significant part of their, their reproductive years in a negative iron balance due to a combination of poor diet and menstrual blood losses. And low hemoglobin and ferritin, which is the, the storage form of your iron in menstruating women has tragically been accepted as normal rather than representing a widespread iron deficiency that's, that's impacting women's health. So when it comes to red meat and why 
people might not be eating so much of it. One of the major issues is this sort of scare around red meat causing cancer. And so you can see here a variety of alarming headlines in the media um, that seem to occur year in, year out. And red meat makes up a smaller and smaller percentage of what we're supposed to, what we're supposed to be eating to stay healthy according to our national healthy eating guidelines. So a lot of the, the studies that are done on red meat and cancer are in the form of epidemiology studies. So we're basically, uh, people are studying uh, large groups of people over time to see who gets cancer and who doesn't and are there any risk factors involved. So that's where most of the data comes from. Unfortunately, this data is not the highest quality. And you can see here on this graph, as the, as the pyramid goes up, the strength of the data gets higher. You can take a bunch of these epidemiological or observational studies and put them together and combine them into something called a meta-analysis or a systematic review to see whether with more numbers, whether there's a, there's a more pronounced effect. But the issue with doing this is that you miss all of these experimental studies. So experimental studies, in particular randomized control trials are generally considered the gold standard when it comes to, to research in medicine. The major limit of epidemiology is it can infer correlation, but not causation. So there are many different factors you can combine to come up with compelling graphs where clearly that the two are not causally related. Uh, and this is a major problem that epidemiology can generally not really overcome. So we're, we're working with a low quality evidence here. There are also many confounders that, are, that can't be accounted for in every study. And typically in nutritional epidemiology, the data collection is often of low quality. Above all else, placing too much faith in epidemiological studies has led to some major mistakes in the past. So even within the, the sort of just the nutritional space, you can think about antioxidants, cholesterol in food. So we've been told to eat and not eggs many, many times over in the last few decades. And the other major battleground that we're struggling with at the moment is this historical uh, argument against saturated fat and heart disease, which again has been based on some pretty flawed research. So in terms of data collection in these studies, this would be a typical uh, um, questionnaire that would be used to, to collect data in these studies, where basically the average user would be told, this is a, the list of foods, and they'll be asked, how, how often do you eat these foods? In, a, in many of these studies, patients are only asked at the start of the study and often not asked again until 10 years later uh, with no questionnaire in the meantime. So you can obviously see how that may cause inaccuracies because I'm sure many of the people listening today would have vastly different diets to what they had a year ago and certainly compared to what they had 10 years ago. So with that being said, the International Agency of Research on Cancer or the IARC, uh, which is a, a part of the WHO, is tasked with uh, studying a variety of chemicals and molecules and determining whether they're carcinogenic to humans. Over the, over the years, they've studied over a thousand different molecules and chemicals and factors uh, and have managed to group them into one of these five groups, ranging from carcinogenic to probably not carcinogenic to humans. In 2015, they, they set out to, to, to study the risk of processed red meat and red meat in terms of the risk and what they decided was that processed red meat was a group one carcinogen so that puts it in the same category as tobacco asbestos and, and plutonium and other nuclear fuels so so some pretty severe factors red meat was classified as a category 2a carcinogen so probably carcinogenic to humans and this group includes a, a more eclectic variety of things including benzyl chloride and other industrial chemicals and interestingly being a night worker or a hairdresser is also classified as a category 2A carcinogen. They released a fine, uh, an initial report in 2015 and then a final report in 2018 with all of the data. And their conclusion at the time was that the consumption of red meat is probably carcinogenic to humans based on limited evidence that the consumption of red meat causes cancer in humans and strong mechanistic evidence supporting a carcinogenic effect. This association was mainly observed for colorectal cancer, although when you look into the data, there's some lesser association for prostate and pancreatic cancer. But overall, that most of their report is, is, is uh, centered on colorectal cancer, so that's what we'll focus on today. Processed meat was classified as carcinogenic to humans based on sufficient evidence that it causes colorectal cancer. So for, for their report, red meat was uh, referring to all mammalian muscle meat, including beef, veal, pork, lamb, mutton, horse, 
goat and processed meat was uh, classified as any meat that's been transformed through salting, curing, fermentation, smoking, or other processes that enhance its flavor and improve preservation. So they've given a few examples, but there were uh, many, many um, different products included. So let's look at the evidence. Uh, when we look at what they used to make these claims, they, they found 14 cohort studies that provided data on the association between red meat and the risk of colorectal cancer. So eight out of those 14 studies showed no link at all. So no link between colorectal cancer and red meat intake. Five out of the 14 studies showed a, a statistical trend that was not significant. In other words, there was a tiny effect, but not great enough to, to be confident that it wasn't just due to chance or due to other confounding factors. So not very convincing. And then finally, there was one, I repeat, one out of 14 studies that showed a convincing link between colon cancer and red meat. So in this study, there was a positive association between red meat and cancer. The relative risk of a red meat eater getting cancer compared to a non-red meat eater if they ate red meat more than once a week was 1.85. In other words, they were 1.85 times more likely to get cancer compared to a non-red meat eater. Now, this study is interesting because it was a study of a cohort in America of Seventh-day Adventists. So this group often is, is more likely to be vegetarian because of their religious beliefs. And within this group, um, red meat eaters tended to drink more alcohol, smoke more, and they tended to be more overweight. So they were less healthy in general. Within this cohort, they found a subset of people that ate a high amount of red meat, a low amount of legumes, and had a high BMI. So they were more likely to be obese. And within this group, the risk of colorectal cancer was particularly high. So it was triple compared to someone who didn't eat red meat. So with processed red meat, it's even harder to make sense of the data because all processed food link to cancer and processed meats are often eaten with other processed foods such as burger buns or high sugar sauces or soft drinks. So it's really hard to tease out what's what. And you also end up with this strange situation where traditionally cured meats, which are often meat salt and curing agent, are being put in the same category as fast food burgers or hot dogs or commercial beef jerky, which is often 20% sugar by weight. So uh, it makes it a very varied uh, group of products to study. The other problem is that people who eat processed food tend to be less health conscious in general. So they smoke more, they drink more, and they tend to be less physically active. So you could very well make the argument that processed red meat intake would not be a cause of poor health, but a marker of poor health consciousness in general. Despite that, they looked at 18 cohort studies evaluating processed red meat and colorectal cancer. Once again, they found that 12 out of 18 studies did not show any significant, statistically significant correlation at all. Six out of 18 found a, a significant correlation, although two of those only found it in males and it wasn't present in females, which typically indicates that the effect size is gonna be pretty small. So at the end of all that, they put all of that data together into a meta-analysis. And the conclusion of this meta-analysis was that the, the, colorectal, the colorectal cancer risk um, was a statistically significant with a dose-response relationship um, of 17% increased relative risk. In other words, a relative risk of 1.17 per 100 grams per day of red meat intake and a relative risk of 1.18 per 50 grams a day per processed meat. So, Overall, that, that's, the, that's the outcome of that meta-analysis. Now, it's important to note that in epidemiology, any relative risk that's under two is considered a weak relationship. So it's considered much more likely to be due to other confounding factors um, that may be involved. Uh, and just to highlight that, if we look at tobacco smoke and lung cancer, which has historically been the great success story of a cancer epidemiology. If you look at those studies, the relative risks they're reporting in those studies are within the range of 10 to 30. So they're way, way, way higher than 1.18. Now, the other thing the IARC did was they put forth some proposed mechanisms for how red meat could cause cancer, because it's not good enough to just say, you found this correlation, you have to be able to try and explain why it might be. And they put forward three main mechanisms for how they felt that red meat might cause cancer. 
the first of these was the, the content of red meat uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the red meat content of heme iron. So this would be a reasonable thing to consider because heme iron is found in animal products and it's not typically found at all in um, plant products. And white meat tends to have lower amounts of heme iron. The potential ways that heme iron might cause red meat are through the formation of N-nitroso compounds, the oxidation of polyunsaturated fats, they looked at some rat studies, so no human studies, only rat studies were done in this area. And what they found is when the rats were fed blood sausage at very high quantities, which having blood in it obviously would mean they're gonna have a lot of heme iron, they found that there was a potential increased risk of colorectal cancer. That being said, in these initial studies, the rats were deliberately uh, kept calcium deficient, to basically to increase the risk of a colorectal cancer forming. Once they did follow-up studies where they reintroduced calcium back into the rats, this appeared to be protective. So at the end of the day, if you are severely calcium deficient and are being fed very, very high doses of PMI, there's potentially some concern, but for the average physiological human diet, this doesn't seem to be particularly significant at all. The second group of uh, factors they looked at were chemicals that occur in the cooking process. The first one of these is heterocyclic amines. And they appear in animal models at, at very, very, very high doses to have some effect on carcinogenesis. But it's important to note that the doses we're talking about here are often a thousand times higher than you would actually get in any human diet. So it's really hard to extrapolate that into, into reality for the average human diet. The other thing to bear in mind is that chicken has high amounts of heterocyclic amines as well. And chicken is not associated with red meat, uh, with, with a colorectal cancer risk in these epidemiological studies. And the researchers looking for this aren't able to convincingly explain that away at all. The second group of chemicals that occur in the cooking process that are relevant are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So these are produced when meat is cooked over a naked flame at high heat, where in essence the, the fat that drifts off the meat hits the, the flame and produces gaseous compounds that immediately stick to the surface of the meat. Uh, in the evidence, it appears that this has a weak effect a potential carcinogenic effect. So if you've ever been told to, to not char your meat or to, to barbecue it so it's black, this is where, where this really likely comes from. Overall, this appears to be a small effect. And if we're really concerned about these chemicals, then we should be mindful that this occurs when you cook anything. That includes charring vegetables, that includes toasting all the cereals that we're advised that we shouldn't be eating. So I think if we're really being honest about that, we need to be looking at other factors as well. The third group of compounds they looked at were the N-nitroso compounds. So these are a, a varied group of compounds that are found in lots of different foods. They're typically added uh, to process meat in the form of nitrites as a curing and coloring agent. They can potentially interact with heme in the gut and that where they can uh, cause uh, direct DNA damage and act as alkylating agents. So these group of chemicals can potentially cause carcinogenesis by, carcinogenesis by the gut in that fashion. The problem with these compounds is that there are a lot of them and we recycle a lot of them in our saliva and many of them are not actually dangerous at all. So when you look at the studies, again, always in rats, um, you need to bear in mind that a rat gut is not the same as a human gut. The microbiome is different. Rats don't recycle these compounds in their saliva. So a rat is not a great model to be studying this. As I mentioned, not all n nitroso compounds are carcinogenic, but when researchers measure the feces and urine of rats to detect these compounds, they're not able to differentiate between which ones are carcinogenic or not. So there's a real measurement issue there if we're gonna be studying these compounds in rats. And once again, the issue is that rats are fed much higher doses of these compounds than a, a typical human diet. So it's really difficult to extrapolate that into reality. So all up, that's not a very convincing uh, outcome of all this mechanistic evidence that the IAC put forward. Now, what, a couple of things they didn't mention I'm going to touch on now, in particular, the issue of meat quality. So this really comes down to two main factors, uh, what the animals are fed, so typically grass-fed versus grain-fed is the argument, and the second is environmental pollutants. So when we look at what rumen animals in particular are fed, when they're grass fed, as opposed to being grain fed, there typically is more omega-3 uh, fatty acids in the meat. There tends to be a higher amount of vitamin A and vitamin E. And overall, there tends to be a lower fat content. Unsurprisingly, uh, 
cows are often fed grains to force slaughter to fatten them up, which which helps with um, its overall uh, cost benefit basically for the farmer. This is some Australian data showing the different fatty acid profiles, but this has been uh, replicated in many other countries. The second group of, uh, of factors to consider are the environmental pollutants. So in the same way that people may worry about uh, the water environment of a fish and what that does to its its toxin levels, uh, the the effect of what a, what an animal is breathing, what it's drinking, what it's eating, and and, and certain veterinary practices can affect the amount of uh, certain environmental pollutants that animal can accumulate. So this is some data to, um, from a lab in Europe uh, where they essentially looked at local foods from their supermarkets and assessed all of these foods for toxic elements, including arsenic, cadmium, lead, and, and mercury dioxins, diphenyl ethers, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. What they found that were elevated levels of organic pollutants and trace elements in a variety of different foods, both fresh and packaged. When they considered the, the meat products, chicken typically had less uh, of these environmental pollutants than red meat. And a lot of the organic pollutants uh, ended up predominantly in the fat of the animal. So I think in the low carb community, we need to be honest and, uh, and circumspect about this because we often are eating fatty, fattier cuts of meat. So at the end of the day, healthy, clean animals are going to produce healthy, cleaner meat. And the, the life the animal lives has a big bearing on all of this. So this is, this is important for us. Um, the take home messages from all of this is that grass fed, grass finished meat is going to be preferable. Organic is ideal. In terms of uh, practical uh, tips, uh, I would suggest that people should be buying local meat if they can, and if you can get to know your farmers, that would be great. And advocacy is important. So we all need to be advocating that we, we would like clean, fresh, well-fed animals uh, for, for our meat. If patients ask me, you know, cost is an issue, what can I do, Doc? I would say that, you know, grain-fed is still likely to be better than not in most non-meat foods. And at the end of the day, if you must eat grains because cost is prohibitive, then at least eat them via a cow because the cow is going to be able to deal with them much better than most humans can. So let's look at some research that may have occurred since the 2018 IARC report, because there's a few things that uh, are probably worth mentioning. The most important one is uh, some research out of this group called Nutrarex. This group was formed uh, a couple of years ago uh, with the aim of providing some research that was free of industry conflicts of interest. So the, the researchers that formed this group uh, had the argument that a lot of the nutritional research that's been done in the past, in particular into things like red meat and cancer, was potentially clouded by the either the financial or the personal bias of the researchers. So in 2019, they released a couple of reports to much controversy, the controversy of which still rages on today, but two of them are worth focusing on here. So the first one was a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, looking into reduction of red meat and processed meat intake and whether that affects your cancer mortality in the future. So in essence, they've asked, well, say you took all that red meat cancer data on board, say you believed it completely and you decided that you were going to reduce your red meat intake with the aim of not getting cancer, is there any evidence that doing that's actually going to change things? And they found, they grouped together over 6 million patients in uh, 73 different articles, and they addressed cancer mortality and cancer incidence. What they found is that for unprocessed red meat, an intake reduction of three servings a week, in other words, if you went from eating three uh, servings of red meat a week, uh, a week to zero, or if you went from seven to four or something similar to that, there was a, a very small decrease in overall cancer mortality. This reduction was not statistically significant uh, when it comes to overall incidence of cancer or the incidence of certain um, specific cancers, including colorectal cancer. So not overly convincing. They also looked at processed meat and once again, an intake reduction of three servings a week was associated with a very small reduction in overall cancer mortality and prostate cancer mortality, but not with any of the gastrointestinal it was associated with very small decreases in terms of uh, esophageal and colorectal cancer, but not with overall cancer. So once again, very small effect sizes, potentially clouded by bias or by confounding factors. 
The second study they looked at was the effect of uh, higher versus lower red meat intake on cardiometabolic and cancer outcomes. And when they looked at grouping studies together for this, they found there were very few high quality trials. Most of them were addressing only surrogate markers. They weren't addressing hard endpoints, such as whether you had a heart attack or whether you died of cancer. And there was very small differences in these trials in terms of who they classified as a high red meat intake eater versus a low red meat intake eater. And their conclusion of this meta-analysis was that there was low to very low certainty evidence that diets restricted in red meat may have little or no effect on cardiometabolic disease or cancer mortality. So in other words, there's not very good quality evidence and there's certainly not, not sufficient evidence to change your eating patterns one way or another based on any of this. And this is not really surprising. When we look at uh, research into other areas of diet, we, we find this pattern come up again and again, where patterns identified in retrospective studies, uh, they rarely hold up when we take them and then put them into an interventional study. So to give some examples, People who eat higher fiber diets are associated with better health in retrospective studies. But if we then take people and put them on a high fiber diet and compare them to another group on a low fiber diet, whether it's studying gut health or microbiome health or cancer prevention, fiber doesn't seem to make much of a difference at all. Similar issue with vegetables. So if we take people and put them on a low vegetable diet versus a high vegetable diet prospectively rather than retrospectively, and we look at oxidative stress markers, there doesn't seem to be effect at all. So this really just highlights that we don't want to take retrospective studies with nutrition uh, too strongly. Now, I'm going to come back to this, this study that I mentioned before, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist study looking at colorectal cancer and red meat. So the one study that showed a convincing link between colorectal cancer and red meat. This is the last paragraph of the conclusion of that study. What they said is they found an increased risk due to red meat intake that occurred only at lower legume intakes and higher body mass. These associations raise the possibility that the risk due to red meat intake was mediated by multiple mechanisms, one of which may involve red meat intake in a constellation of causal factors that produce higher plasma insulin levels. So that's a very interesting question to ask. When we look at the research, there's a lot of evidence that this might be the case. So this slide in, uh, shows you a variety of different ways in which obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes can uh, increase the risk of cancer cell growth uh, or formation. So obesity has a direct effect on adipose tissue in terms of reducing a sex hormone gut binding globulin and increasing circulating estrogen levels. This has a direct effect in terms of increasing the risk of breast cancer and endometrial cancer in particular. Insulin is directly uh, involved in tumor cell growth and indirectly via IGF-1 receptor upregulation and increasing amounts of IGF-1 in the circulation. And somewhat separate to all of this is the multiple effects on the intestinal gut microbiome, which uh, increases the, the circulating amounts of various inflammatory cytokines. So you can see here there are many different pathways which all of this can increase a person's risk of cancer. Uh, and all of this is actually what strong mechanistic evidence looks like. None of this is controversial or disputed. Uh, this is well studied. And when we look at what that looks like in the real world, we can see that diabetes is a major risk factor for cancer. You can see here there are multiple different meta-analyses looking at various different cancers, not just colorectal cancer. And when we look at the relative risks of uh, getting cancer if you're diabetic, you can see here that the relative risk reported are much, much higher than 1.18 in most cases. So, so for many patients uh, who are insulin resistant or diabetic, it may be that that is their major risk factor, assuming they don't smoke or drink heavily. Obesity has a similar effect on cancer risk. So I'm just going to highlight a few of these now. So colorectal cancer, you can see the relative risk, again, is, is higher than 1.18, both for males and females. Esophageal carcinoma shows a, a, a much higher uh, rate of, um, of incidence in people who are obese. And this is not surprising because it tends to be more common in people who have gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is a disease that's often associated with obesity and often gets better with weight loss. And finally, you'll see here endometrial cancer and obesity is very closely linked because of that aforementioned uh, increasing uh, estrogen circulation. 
So in conclusion, uh, red meat's associated with a small uh, increase in colorectal cancer in meta-analyses. This is only on the basis of observational data. It has not been replicated in interventional studies at all. And it may be related to various confounding factors, including the processing of meat contaminants or the cooking process. Above all else, it's never really been tested on a Western population of low carb or paleo or ketogenic or carnivore eaters. In other words, people who are actively involved in a healthy lifestyle. And there are bigger risks to be wary of, especially if you are overweight and obese or a type two diabetic. At the end of the day, a nutrient dense whole food based diet is what's likely to be the best for optimal health for most people. And for most people, that's going to include high quality red meat. All right, with that, I'll draw the talk to a close. So thank you for all the attendees again. Um, one final word, I'd just like to say that our, just once again, our clinic is located in Castle Hill in Sydney. We offer telehealth consults nationally and we, we welcome referrals for either the doctors or dietitians. Um, email and social media is there. And we're delighted to announce that anyone who's attended the summit uh, this weekend is uh, entitled to a 10% discount on any initial consult um, with our staff. All right, thank you very much.